Welcome everybody to another episode of the None of Our Businesses YouTube show and podcast, the Roundtable Edition. Uh, as always on the on this uh, session, it's a weekly update of news and current events from an accountant's perspective or from several accounts' perspective. Because with me here today, like always, is uh, Charlie Zygman and AJ Wheeler. Hey guys. Hey everybody. All right. Well, we've got a few topics to to get into today, so let's do it. Who wants to go first? You want to get us started, AJ? Sure. All right. First article comes our way this week from the uh, <clears throat> Journal of Accountancy and the AICPA Council uh, just supports the advancement of a new CPA licensure model. So actually, I'm going to share my screen really quick, show you guys a quick uh, shot of this. So this is their new, this is basically what they voted on. So none of the finalization has been made as to the changes to the test, but this is kind of their idea of going forward. So the CPA license will basically, you'll have a core of accounting audit tax and what they're calling tech. But this, this probably is super amalgamous to what there is the four parts of the CPA uh, exam now. And now they're saying you need a core competency in this and then some kind of advanced knowledge in one of these three areas. And so basically the reasoning behind it is they think those three areas are the future of the CPA like profession. And they, and those, so not only will you have to have a core in accounting, audit, tax, and tech, the three, the four core pieces, but you'll need to show advanced knowledge in one of these three areas. So tax compliance and planning, business reporting and analysis, and information systems and controls. So I don't know. I thought this was pretty interesting. I, I was kind of trying to see if they had missed an area here. And I, and I think it probably is the, the, I guess the, you know, it looks like one of those Simon repeats games, but I think the outside ring is probably encompassing enough of what we think the future is going to be. But I'm just wondering from your guys' perspective, if they've missed something. Well, I thought it, I thought it was interesting that they didn't actually have audit or assurance services on the outside ring. Um, I mean, they still include audit in the, in the core thing, but it, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I've always found it interesting that accountants have this like dual identity of what they really do versus what they want to think of themselves as. Um, and I throw myself in that category as well. And then when I see this, it kind of, it, it kind of reminds me that, yeah, it's not just me. It's like our whole profession has this kind of, uh, this kind of issue of what we actually do versus what we see ourselves doing in the future or versus what we want to be seen as because I mean, the reality of those, all those core competencies to me is that <clears throat> when you look at those core competencies on the outside ring, those aren't actually not things that the CPA license has unique, uh, uh, unique monopoly on. The only thing that the CPA license actually has a unique monopoly on is what we call assurance services, right? You have to be a CPA to do audits. You have to be a CPA to do uh, to do uh, compilations and reviews and those what they call assurance services. That's the piece that's regulated by states that requires a CPA license. The other piece is having knowledge or expertise in uh, information and control systems doesn't require a CPA license. There's other consultants who also do that. Uh, being a specialist in tax compliance and, and uh, tax matters, there's other professions, including lawyers and uh, enrolled agents and other professional credentials that that can do that. And uh, what was the other one? Oh, business processes and management information or something like that. It's business reporting and analysis. Business reporting and analysis. So yeah, again, that that's you know from an in, from a management perspective, that's usually an unlicensed. Uh, you know, a lot that is what a lot of accountants who don't have licenses per se that's what they do or what they end up in. So um, <clears throat> I, being a CPA, I, I certainly promote the idea that CPAs have good qualifications in those areas or potentially if they're specialized in those areas, they may be, be among the best professionals to do those things. But, um, but my only point is that is, that's not, those aren't things that they are uniquely qualified to do. They're not the only ones qualified to do it. Their license doesn't, our license as CPAs, doesn't give us a monopoly over that the way it does over assurance services. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, just juxtaposition 
that the one thing that our license actually gives us a monopoly over is not front and center in that model. I also might say that I think they might have missed, you know, CPA, Certified Public Accountant. I don't necessarily know that, like, to, and to your point there, um, of the outside ring, you know, the only thing that, that you're actually required to have a CPA license to perform the audit function would be the one thing that I would think they would kind of enhance because it's kind of built into the fact that you need a public accounting firm with CPAs to be able to perform an audit for them. Either you have the SEC side where you're auditing public companies or you're on the other side where you're auditing small comp- smaller companies that are not listed or nonprofits per se that require it due usually to bank loans or to charters or to grantors in the case of nonprofits. So I thought it was interesting. And I guess maybe in my mind, maybe I think they might be, I think they might be having an identity crisis almost where they like Ty saying, where you want to, you want to be something that you're quite not yet. So, and to Ty's point, the business reporting and analysis, they have the certified managerial accountant of tests that kind of like, you know, emphasizes that portion of the model. If you're talking information systems and controls, so much of that is going to be an IT and they have specialty like auditors or whatever you want to call it that don't require a license. That's like a, an IT audit or a process audit that it's often called that most of the time performed by a CPA, but then, and then the tax compliance and, and planning, like Ty said, lawyers can do it enrolled agents so it's yeah i guess i don't know it's it's a it's a tough question i think to ask and i think it's 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 a little it's a little bit different and i think it it seems a little bit strange but the only thing i do like about it is that i do think that the things that they've chosen to be kind of on the spokes are so different that i can totally imagine a person who has a really strong skill set in one of those three and not so much in the other uh, or, or in the other two and so, um, yeah, I think it, I think everything that you guys are saying is totally right. But I just think that there's so many different branches that somebody can take an accounting career. And so it's like, it seems to be good that the CPA exam is acknowledging that there's different areas of expertise that an accountant can go into and then trying to cater the licensure to, to fit that, you know? Um, but yeah, it, it does seem a little bit strange, um, that audit isn't one of them, you know? Yeah, I think, and I think if anybody in the world is to hold up the importance of an independent audit, um, it should be, uh, it should be the CPA um, <clears throat> profession, the CPA bodies, the institutions. And so I would say the cynical side of me says that, yeah, it's almost, it's a little bit disheartening that they don't, uh, that they don't place that more front and center um, because, you know, yeah, like I said, I mean, nobody else in the world is really going to uh, promote the importance of of an uh, independent audit and independent auditors in the financial system more than uh, the CPA profession itself. So when when we, yeah, I, I just I just think that they shouldn't they shouldn't necessarily give up that ground, and that's coming from somebody who is actually not, I don't do audits. I don't do assurance services. So I don't actually use my CPA license that way, but I have a healthy respect for my colleagues who do and understand that they actually use their licenses for what they were intended for versus somebody like me who uses the license as just this, like, uh, this, this thing that enhances my resume, right? That's how I use it. For me, my license is a resume enhancer. And for them, their license is what's intended for. And I feel like this model is designed to help me more than them. And while I, you know, self-servingly, I might appreciate that. I just, I feel a little bit of loss on that. I don't, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that's where the professional body should be focusing, but, but yeah. I also might want to mention that uh, I think it was, I don't know, five or 10 years ago, they were completely, Complaining that less and less people were getting CPAs because it's not as the world moves forward, uh, you know, there kind of isn't that. I guess there is reference for the CPA licensure, but you don't need a CPA licensure to be a successful accountant per se. And I think more and I think more and more people are realizing that. And so, in the past, they've talked about 
you know, making the CPA exam more broad or an easier kind of entry to it, I think was some discussion that they've had in the past. And I'm just wondering if, if given the amount of work that it takes to get through the four test as it is, as it stands now, if you're tacking on these outside layers as additional specific deep dive information that they're wanting people to know, if that will be even a larger barrier to people coming in, and if, and if we'll see a drop in the amount of, of applicants or the amount of people passing the exam or going after it, that would, that would kind of limit the amount of CPAs and could possibly dilute the licensure, the, the public's image of the licensure. I would also wonder if one of the spokes is you know, inherently easier or more difficult or to obtain than the other ones, because I could imagine people cherry picking it. If any one of them is sort of the weak link there, then everybody would focus on that just to get through the licensure, which right now isn't really something you can do as much um, without this change in place. For sure. I think that's for sure going to, yeah, I think that's a good call out. I mean, that's human nature. <laughs> and I think that's we're def that we definitely will see. Uh, we'll definitely see that happen having having taught in uh, taught accounts in the university level for over a decade I can I can definitely say for sure if you create an you you create you create a path towards certification and there's kind of an easier route than others most will try to squeeze themselves through that easier path uh, so that, that, that's for sure the case that brings me to my next question which one do you guys think is the easiest path that someone could take <laughs> Well, it, okay. depends, uh, it depends on how they implement these, really. I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard to say in the abstract because I think, you know, if, with careful implementation, you could make them all very difficult. Um, even, you know, I think the one that seems that on the front end, when you, when you don't have a lot of experience, um, that would seem kind of the most difficult from a technical standpoint would be taking a deeper dive into a technical topic like tax. Um, but... But yeah, it just depends on, you know, that you can make a deeper dive into a more uh, generalized topic like uh, uh, business reporting. Um, you, you could make that more difficult too, um, just depending on where you go with it. So I think that goes back to what AJ was saying about is this, is this new model going to be easier or harder, right? And I mean, I, I don't think there's any reason to think it'd be easier. It could be harder, but not necessarily because you could, they could be pulling, they could be kind of decreasing the difficulty of what they're calling the core layer to increase the difficulty of the external layer so that the total thing is about the same difficulty as it ever was before. Um, so yeah, I guess it'll all be in the implementation. We'll see. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. So, all right, I've got another article we can kind of move on to if that's okay. So we've got an article from Reuters entitled, What Did Eight Weeks and Three Trillion Buy Us by the U.S. in the Fight Against Coronavirus? And so it's talking about all the different aid programs that have been put out to try to uh, combat the economic effects of coronavirus. Uh, talked about some of the talking points were that it had the U.S. Federal Reserve had put about $2.5 trillion behind global and domestic markets. Um, the, there was this fear originally of, uh, well, it's still there, but the fear of overwhelming the hospital system has calmed down a lot, but a bunch of uh, analysts still feel afraid that even though we aren't going to overwhelm the hospitals in the near future, that we aren't prepared for some of the economic impacts of, of the coronavirus. And so, um, yeah, I guess it just was interesting that they were talking about how the um, the enhanced 600 unemployment. So you know the unemployment program where the federal uh, the federal side of unemployment added 600 a week to the benefits, and how that's going to go away in July. And then there is a uh, economist from Harvard, I believe his name was James Stock, and he said that basically we're, there's two paths we should be going down. We should either be going down the route towards strictly lockdown and doing that perfectly, or we should go to cavalier acceptance of the death toll and, and in an attempt to build herd immunity to allow people to die off such that the you know, virus can be contained. And his take on it was that we aren't really doing either one of those. And he thinks that our attempts to kind of have, I don't want to say, um, yeah, our attempts to open in a lackluster way, what that maybe isn't as thought out as it could be, are causing, what, what he believes will happen is that there will be pockets of the disease that will still, or of the virus that will still flourish. And so um, I guess I just wanted to kind of 
pontificate on the question of, you know, what is the real scarier part of the coronavirus? Is it the actual disease or the virus, or is it the economic impact as a whole? Because we're looking at all this unemployment and we're looking at all of these changes to industry that I just don't know that everyone is ready to, um, you know, handle. And so I want to get you guys' take on it. Well, I think we've said on this podcast before that we think that the climb back of the economies is going to be slow. And I think, you know, um, the reopening of America is going to be slow. And so, I mean, we see it just in our state. <clears throat> There's these phases that we have to go through and apply for. And I think that's going to have a lot of effect on consumer behavior and on tax revenues, on revenues coming in for businesses. So it'll have an effect all the way around. Um, I think we're seeing the effect of that now when they're talking about lowering interest rates again or negative interest rates. I think we have an article later we're going to talk about it. So I don't know. It's it's it. I don't think you know there's going to be this huge bounce back like we're talking about. Yeah, I think the the economic impact is um, is probably going to be um, not good. <laughs> yeah, I mean I don't know. I it, you, to put a value judgment to say that it's worse than the you know, it's hard to put a value judgment on it because it depends on whether you lost a loved one or not in, in this as well. Right. But, um, I think, I think what the, what the author was saying or what the, the, uh, person that the author was citing was saying about, um, it's that, what's that term being half pregnant? You can't be half pregnant. I think that's the issue here is that, is that we're not being governed by a strategy. We're being governed by the, you know, how people feel it at, at the moment, right? So being, you know, trying to uh, social distance and to uh, stay at home is a strategy. You can agree with it or disagree with its effectiveness, but it's, it's one strategy for uh, dealing with this with an expected result. Uh, going for herd immunity and, and leaving things completely open so that you can achieve herd immunity is another strategy. And again, you know, I don't know the science to know which of those is, is actually the better way to go. And, and from what I've seen and, and read and listened to, the science may not be conclusive on that point either. So it is just a matter of, you know, which medicine do you want to take? But, the, but, I, but I agree with what we're doing now is not, is not a strategy, right? There is, no, there is no such strategy as follow a stay at home order until everyone just gets tired of staying at home and then start opening up because you can't handle the political pressure anymore. And so, you know, people are going to get all mad at you and uh, you've got a president who's disagreeing with your governor. And so let's just, let's just start opening up to make people happy. There's no strategy like that. There's a, you can't tie that to here's a strategy that then will then lead to a certain health outcome. Right. And so, I don't have to be a scientist to know that, to know that that activity and how it's being motivated and what's happening isn't tied to any kind of scientific strategy or tactic that we're trying to achieve. So um, I find that very disturbing. And I feel like, I feel like it be, what, what I hate more than anything in my life is, is the idea of wasted effort. It's like if we went down one road and then we just totally stopped doing it because we just can't take our medicine, then then all of the sacrifice we've made to date on that becomes just wasted effort. And that's very disheartening. I, I agree. I think we have to pick a path and stick to it and, you know, to be consistent in our approach so that we can get through this problem. And uh, it seems like every state is just coming up with their own answer to that, or not even every state, but every county or every, you know, every business individually even. And so, yeah, it's definitely difficult to get everybody on the same page. All right, you got another article we can discuss, AJ? Yeah, this one actually comes our way uh, from Small Business Trends, but basically it was, a, it was an article on the, what, posing the question, what is the future of passwords? And so it goes through a long history of kind of passwords. We won't go through it, but 19, like 1960 was the first password. But what I thought was interesting was 66% of people reuse passwords. I'll, I'll be included in that list. And so, but 91% they say they know they shouldn't, but they use them anyway. And um, basically they talk about where, where the, the future of passwords go and they talk about, you know, the thumbprint uh, 
authorization, the, you know, the phone call or text for the second authorization code to be able to know it's really you when you're logging into something. But they're talking about, you know, um, risk-based auth authentication, whereas determine basically your IP address, your device posture, geolocation, all of that is access to be able to uh, understand, is this really coming from the person that's trying to access the information? So I was, I guess I'll pose the question to you guys. Do you feel like, you know, and, and I'm sure this is probably an old topic, but having your thumbprint on, on file somewhere or your eye sc retina scans or something like that used um, for password authentication, if, if there's any thoughts of personal privacy invasion or if you think that maybe all, the, all of the fuss over passwords is overblown? Uh, no, I mean, I think the password fear is right on. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's such a key system that we all rely on every day and nearly everything that we do. And so we have to have some kind of meaningful system behind it. And uh, through my work, I've had a lot of interesting discussions actually on this topic about what is about how to how to be safest, really, because, um, for example, here's one of the arguments that I've gotten into before, which I think fits into this really well. Um, there's a tool called LastPass, and what it does is it helps you generate random passwords and saves them so that when you go to websites, you can always have unique passwords and always have different, um, you know, different passwords for every site and that kind of a thing. And so I've had arguments, I've had people say, well, you should use that because it will enable you to then never reuse your password. But then I've had other people say, well, aren't you then putting all of your eggs in one basket? And so if anything ever happens to LastPass, then your entire system is compromised. And so I think it kind of goes back to something that you said, which it's like, well, it's a risk analysis. It really depends on what specifically you're afraid of. If you use one password on every site and you're just afraid that some website is going to get that leaked, then LastPass becomes the right way to do it because you're just trying to keep them unique and you know sooner or later one will get compromised. You're not worried about that source. You're just worried about being having strong practices. Um, the other thing I think is interesting is that on the credit card side, that has been the same kind of risk analysis has been in use for a while in trying to determine whether or not charges are fraudulent as they get passed into a credit card. So it creates kind of like a risk score based on the amount, the history, kind of the location. And so I do like the idea of password risk analysis getting built into the process so that, you know, there can be a more meaningful um, attempt to verify really. Um, but yeah, I think it's an interesting, interesting topic and a lot of different viewpoints to juggle with. Yeah, I think um, this is uh, this is an area I don't have very much experience or technical knowledge on, except from just a management standpoint. And um, I remember over a year ago, it might have been one or it might have been two years ago now that um, an article came out, and and you guys may remember the that there. I, I don't know if this is still common in a lot of places, but there was a push always to have to update your passwords, to change your passwords. So um, a little bit different than the main topic of this article, which is taking one password and reusing it across multiple locations. This idea was, well, you have a password to access a system, but in order to avoid it getting hacked, you should change that specific password for that specific system, you know, periodically, you know, whatever, whatever period you should do that. And I think a lot of companies and organizations had adopted that and it became like this common knowledge that that was the thing to do, that, that doing that was a, was an important safety procedure. And it, it turned out that uh, 20 years before the person, some, some person had come up with this idea. Um, I think somehow it was related to the NSA. Um, they had, they had published this idea as, as, as an important thing. And 20 years later, they were they they did some follow up research, and the very person who came up with this idea said, "Yeah, actually, after 20 years of this, it, it's actually not true. That changing your password over and over again, there's no actual data that that actually improves the the <laughs> the security or safety of your passwords." So, so <clears throat> I mean, like a lot of things, what's so uh, what what is um, uh, revealing about that is that I think what is truly, uh, what truly makes your password secure or not secure, I think is one of those evolving things that we don't have a complete scientific understanding of because it has to do in part with social behavior, right? And we don't have complete 
understanding of social behaviors, either on the side of the people who have the passwords or on the side of the high hackers. Um, and so I think, I, think, I think the story is still yet to be written as to what, what truly bears out as, uh, as the most secure ways to do things. I think we do things as a matter of, sounds like a good idea, but there actually isn't a, a lot of research behind that uh, why 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 doing that is necessary in order to be secure, and I don't mean that against this particular topic, but just in passwords in general. That's that's what made me think about this. Is it's one of those things. I think that's that's actually really interesting because I was just reading a thing the other day um, that fits kind of the same thing. You know, everybody has switched to two-factor authentication as the way to keep secure to where it goes through your phone. But that has caused there to be this new practice called SIM hacking, where basically somebody goes into a uh, like a T-Mobile store and they get enough info on you to be able to like go in there and get authenticated through your account. And so you're already compromised in some way in the story, but by the fact that you've routed absolutely everything through this two-factor thing then when somebody is able to then take your phone number and get it onto their sim card it then you know opens them up to be able to connect to absolutely everything that you've done as a good example of what you're talking about how we thought we were adding this feature to make passwords better but at that same time we introduced a problem that didn't quite exist at least not in the same you know style as it is now. So yeah, I, I agree. It's going to be evolving for a long time. And the biometric thing has, it has always seemed like a good idea, but it's always just like really tripped me out as far as the idea of like, well, if somebody's going to try to get into my personal information and they're willing to do whatever that takes, do I really want my finger or some other body part as far as the, you know, the thing that stands between me and my, uh, the safety of my information or whatever. So I've never been a big fan of, of that. I don't know what you guys think about that. I heard a I heard a story once about a security expert that was sitting in a conference and they were talking about a new biometric hand scanner. So they do this whole half hour presentation of this of this biometric hand scanner. And the first person to ask a question asked the question that says, Does the hand need to be attached? Meaning, like if somebody wanted to break in, they're not gonna just get your keys, they need your hand. So the easiest thing to do is to take off your hand and take it with them than opposed to like bring the whole person with you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's real. Like, like it seems like a punchline, but like, you know, every, every choice that we make as far as how we're going to do this password thing has some level of consequence we just have to consider, you know? All right. So uh, you had kind of foreshadowed this earlier, so I'll kind of switch gears and just jump right into it. Uh, there's an article in The Telegraph called Investors Pay to Lend the Treasury Money as, Bailey's hint, as Bailey Hints at Negative Rates. And so what's happening is that in the UK, uh, the Bank of England it, governor is revising his stance on the possibility of taking rates below zero. Uh, this is the first time in UK history, I guess, that this has happened. And what's happening is people are so afraid about the future of their currency and of their money that they're willing to pay basically a small insurance premium in the form of interest expense on the deposits that they hold, uh, either with the bank and it also talked about with uh, bonds and other financial instruments uh, getting affected by this as well. It talked about how inflation had plunged to near a four-year low, which made bonds uh, come with less worry because they weren't as afraid that they would get devalued over time. And um, the interesting thing is the article kind of made it sound like he was taking that stance. But if once you, when you read the headline, it sounds like the governor is going to say, okay, we're going to do negative interest rates. But um, when you read it more carefully, what I found is that what he was really saying is that we're going to not rule out any possibility of any, pos of, of any move that we might do to solve this because this is a different time and we need to be taking this as a chance to kind of reevaluate our tools. And so I thought about that and I was wondering whether or not you guys feel that a crisis is a good time to kind of reevaluate your tools because on the one hand, you know, it seems like, yeah, it's a crisis. We have to do something drastic, so we should be looking at any option. But on the other hand, it's difficult to try new things and do new maneuvers uh, during a time of crisis. And so I just kind of want to get your guys' take on whether or not now is the time to um, do negative interest rates or in general, just revise our strategies on things. I mean, I think, I think, Negative interest rates sound very intriguing to me, and the, this topic has come up in the U.S. as well. Um, and just 
Yeah, it's just interesting in the sense of I don't have a clear picture of exactly how it works. I have a feeling that there's so many banking layers between, for example, if this were to happen in the U.S., there's so many banking layers between the Federal Reserve and the end user of money that that it doesn't it doesn't truly result in a borrower getting paid to borrow the money. <laughs> I think is my guess is that is that there's a bunch of middlemen taking taking cuts out of that until what it really results in is an extremely low rate or, or a rate near zero or whatever. Right. But I think that, um, I think, I think it, you know, the concept setting that aside, the concept of essentially paying people to take money and use it is a very interesting concept. And I think, I guess, philosophically in my mind, it would depend on what they're using it for. Um, I think that taking people, paying people to take money and use it to build businesses or take risks that uh, employ people and things like that sounds like it could be a very interesting uh, strategy. Paying people to, because remember when we say we're paying people to borrow money with negative interest rates, the catch to this is the people still have to pay the money back, right? They get paid, they get paid to, to use the money but then they still have to give the money back at some point, right? And so if it becomes like, <clears throat> I think people getting paid to take money and then use it, say as consumers, people who otherwise uh, would not be able to pay that money back, I don't, I don't know that that necessarily helps anything. <laughs> so I think, I think, you know, it's, um, yeah. So those are kind of some of my initial thoughts on it, but just, really not knowing anything about it, those are some things that just come to my mind. Well, I mean, the other interesting thing is like, that also happens on your deposits. I've seen it happen in the EU where other non-UK EU countries had implemented negative interest rates on deposits. So basically by just having some money in the bank, that's all you had to do to participate in this, I don't want to call it a phenomenon, but you know, to participate in negative interest rates, you just had to have a little bit in the bank and you just get hit with an interest charge. And so, yeah, the mechanics of kind of how it plays out are, are interesting to say the least. Yeah. That part's a little bit easier to understand conceptually in my mind is like, because you can analogize it to like a storage fee, right? It's like, Hey, I'm, I'm how you're warehousing my money for me. So I'm paying you a warehousing fee to keep it kind of thing. Right. Cause if you literally like, you know, let's say that you had like, truckloads of bricks of gold and you weren't burying them in the backyard, you undoubtedly, you have to house those somewhere, probably with some type of security and you would pay for that warehousing of that asset. Right. So, so that, that part is not as much of a mind warp for me. The idea that you might have to pay somebody to store your money. <laughs> um, you know, if, you know, it results in the same, it results in the same overall incentive though, right? The incentive is not, it's not only, hey, maybe you should borrow money and spend it because it's you get paid for it. But also, if you just have a bunch of cash sitting there, the incentive is, hey, you shouldn't be paying to warehouse it. You should be spending it on other assets that are valuable or that move things forward without, without you getting hit with that charge, right? So I, I think it, you know, from a business perspective, it should have the same incentive, right? It should stop, you know, it's very interesting because we had a, we had a topic previously on this podcast and uh, we had some content that got um, cut that got uh, derived from that topic. And, and it actually brought up some interesting conversation on LinkedIn because I had made the statement that, that historic, that in recent history, we want companies to spend money. We don't want them to sit on cash. We want them to spend money. And, you know, we don't want them to, to just sit on cash because you know, they're, they're only helping themselves when they sit on cash. They're not, they're not really helping the, the, the economy wide, right. In terms of taking risks and growing and stuff like that. And I got, I got some pushback from people saying, well, you know, uh, smart companies or produce or financially prudent companies are those that are conservative or are good at managing their businesses, you know, are, are saving cash reserves. And the ones that did that are now in better, circumstances because uh, the context of me saying that was you know let's not let's not browbeat these companies that ran out of money during this crisis because they didn't have big cash reserves they were doing what we'd want them to do we don't want companies to just sit on cash and then the pushback was well 
you know, had they sat on cash, they would have been able to weather this better. And that would, you know, that would be more financially prudent and, and all that. But I guess I would point out that, that the, these uh, central banks uh, talking about negative interest rates are promoting exactly what I'm saying. They're telling, they're telling companies, they're telling businesses, we don't want you to just sit on cash. That, that's what this is about. I also think that si when we had that discussion, we talked about size mattering, where if you were a larger company, you were probably even more, or a publicly traded company, you were probably more at odds by having a large cash balance because you weren't paying out dividends or reinvesting it in the business or reinvesting in your workers or reinvesting in your R&D. And I think it's true here where you're talking about large, large depositors having uh, large balances at the bank, that's going to, this kind of negative interest rate is going to affect them much more. It's going to turn them into trying to invest that into a market to make money in a different way other than just warehousing it for safekeeping. And so, and same thing true with business. If you have, if you're sitting on a cash reserve, now you're being penalized for doing so. So it'll be interesting because um, I don't think we've seen a long sustained portion of negative interest rates. We haven't seen negative interest rates in the U S ever. I don't believe. So, I mean, I guess it'll be an interesting, you know, fiscal monetary policy change. The other thing I noticed that I just want to bring up here is it, it was a different discussion and a little bit of a different topic, but it seemed to have the same theme, which is the, uh, when, when we were talking about when uh, major airlines would get bailed out with, with government money and then would use all that money to buy back treasury stock as opposed to investing it in assets or doing something else with it, it seems like kind of that same thing. It's a question of whether or not the company is going to sit on that money or do something with it that we believe will further the economy or not we the pejorative we as in the people giving them the money. Um, so yeah, interesting topic. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a variant of the, of the point of that paying people to borrow money depends on what they use it for. And I think what you're pointing out is you can try to regulate that, but then companies can potentially skirt it, right? I mean, they can essentially take that money and then, you know, by various mechanisms, just siphon it off to, to, to shareholders and and uh, not not do anything necessarily productive with it, um, and then the shareholders ultimately have to do something with it. But you know, all you know, if they're subject to the same, what's interesting about that, if they're subject to the same negative interest rate scheme, then the shareholders don't have an incentive to just sit on it. But then it's well, what do the shareholders do with that money? If they start other businesses or they they uh, deploy the capital of their businesses, then maybe that works out fine. But if they use it to buy bigger mansions or go on vacations or things like that, then yeah, maybe not so fine. Well, even then, at least they're spending. Yes, <laughs> at least they're spending, but yeah, they're leaving somebody with the bill to have to pay that all that money back some, somehow. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It's like one giant, giant shell game where they're just passing the money back and forth. <laughs> is what it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So my, my next article is not quite as sexy. Uh, FASB has delayed the revenue recognitions and lease standards in response to coronavirus. So we talked about this a little while ago as this was on the table. Um, and it came out, I guess, on the 20th, May 20th, 2020 here, that uh, FASB voted Wednesday to give private companies and not-for-profits an extra year to comply with the revenue recognitions and lease standards. So what this is resulting, well, what the the these rules are and public companies have had to abide by this for two years now, I think it went into effect in 2018. So, but they're giving um, small com private companies and not for profits that haven't issued their financial statements yet or made them available for issuance to adopt this uh, going forward in 2021 or in 2020, excuse me. So for a period starting after, excuse me, uh, the leasing delays are for fiscal year starting after December 15th, 2021. And uh, with fiscal years beginning after December 15th, 20, uh, 2022. But early adaptation application is permitted. So what this is, is where if you have a lease over a year, it kind of conforms more to the FASB standards where you actually book it on the uh, a balance sheet as a... Uh, lease opportunity or a lease obligation that's resulted there instead of just putting it as a rent 
anyway, I'd, I'd like to get your guys' idea on, I guess, was this a hard lobbying effort, I guess, or <laughs> is this a needed change during these times? Do we think that small businesses and nonprofits were too, this was too much to handle, I guess, for them? I mean, I, I, do, I do think it's a lot of extra work for uh, small businesses and not for profits. Uh, I haven't seen the leasing. I haven't seen how the work plays out on the leasing side yet because that was that was set to be a little bit later for <coughs> that zone. But I mean, in our consulting practice, that's the area we play in is with private businesses and not-for-profits. We have seen this play out with the revenue recognition standard hitting private companies. And I guess the thing about the dates that, that I... Uh, I'm not sure I caught correctly, but are they saying because the revenue recognition standard was actually originally for, for most private companies was set to hit for companies with, uh, with uh, fiscal years that began after December 15th, 2018. Um, and so, um, yeah, annual reporting periods that begin after uh, December 15th, 2018. So that means that, that, a lot of companies with calendar year ends for 2019 were already having to apply and under that we're already applying the revenue recognition standards. I mean, companies that I know of that, that, that I work with were already working through this process for their 2019 financial statements. We're sitting here in May. So many of those companies would have already had to issue their, their annual financial statements with this new guidance in there with the, with the new revenue recognition in there. So, are they saying that now that that was pushed back a year, as in they may not have had to do that? I mean, if they just didn't get their audit done yet, they can just not have done it. <laughs> they can just wait and push that out a year. I, I, I think that's what this article is saying, but I wasn't sure I caught that right. Yeah, it says at the end of the, the first paragraph the, under the revenue recognition, now they will have an extra year to apply the revenue recognition standards. The effective date will now be for annual reporting periods beginning after December 15th, 2019 and interim reporting periods with annual reporting periods beginning after December 15th, 2020. Yeah, so yeah, thanks for the help guys, but kind of late, right? right. <laughs> because that means that if you have a 2019 financial statement, then you now under this new guidance can wait to apply the revenue recognition standards until 2020. But if you already got your audit, we're sitting in May, right? So for any private company that already got this done, you know, or even a not-for-profit perhaps that already got this done. Uh, yeah, they're, this didn't help them. You just now need to put all your revenue recognition fraud into that time period in which things <laughs> were delayed. I'm kidding, don't do that. We're not advocating that. That's not what the rule said. Well, and to be honest, it's a complex issue because uh, revenue recognition, <clears throat> you know, model that they have where you have to break down the contracts in peace is very arduous for like us uh, for not for profits they've had to do something in the past similar to it they issued like clarifications around what are barriers to recording the revenue in a contract with or a grant uh proposal or in a grant document but yeah it does take a lot and the leases too there's no materiality behind those lease regulations so every lease whether it be a coffee machine a copier you know any of those, there's not a de minimis amount that applies. So everything has to be tracked now in some kind of lease schedule or amortization schedule with this new kind of lease obligation recognition. So there is a lot of work behind it and a lot of like, I guess, you know, bookkeeping or record keeping behind it that needs to be done. So, but yeah, Ty's right. At least they gave them a little longer on the leases, not so much on the revenue recognition side. Yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of the not-for-profits will probably be okay because a lot of those not-for-profits have uh, year-ends that aren't calendar year-ends. And of course, not for nothing, a lot of for, a lot of privately held for-profit companies, you know, I keep saying it's May already, you would think their financial statements are done, but we know the truth about that. A lot of privately held for-profit companies, their financial statements actually aren't done yet for 2019 or they aren't, they haven't gone through whatever assurance service they might be getting under gap. And, you know, there's some of those that sometimes they take 10 months before they get them done. So there is a, there is a huge population of people helped by this. I just feel burned because of all the work we did with some clients that, uh, that, that weren't helped by this because they issued timely. Yeah. You were operating under best, you know, best practices. You were doing what felt right at the time, you know? Yeah. Good. 
Yeah, thing. another another example of uh, it's not, it's not always helpful to be super timely or on top of things. You you think it is, but you often find in accounting and tax rules, <laughs> waiting to the last minute can often help you in a lot of ways. <laughs> why, that's why I never do anything until it's way too late. That's just, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had, a, I had a partner once tell me there was no early adoption of anything because we needed to find all the examples of the footnotes and everything else and how everybody else did it first. So let somebody else take the burden of doing it first and then we'll see how, what they got in trouble for or what they did right and we'll take that, you know. <laughs> I like that strategy. That's pretty smart. Right. <laughs> but it's, you know, it reminds me of a slew of sayings. No, no, no good deed goes unpunished, right? There's no, no reason to be too early and, and on, uh, super on top of things or, uh, you know, the, yeah, the path to what it was the other ones, like the path to hell is paved with good intentions. That's another <laughs> Yes. <laughs> or, or the one my mom always used to say there's there's well no this one is the opposite of that idea the one the one my mom used to say no re no rest for the wicked but, but that's not on point that's that's going the opposite direction yeah yeah the early bird gets the worm is also yeah. back yeah. Yeah. no rest for the wicked i think applies to all of our all of our accounting colleagues who uh work on deadlines and every time a deadline is every time a deadline is kind of pushed back uh, and they wickedly, so to speak, you know, follow that later deadline. It seems like they're always just in this world of more and more work. <laughs> I don't know. I'm stretching. I'm stretching now, probably. I, I've seen that. I, I, I'm just more whiskey, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So while we're going good on this uh, deep technical accounting, this is the later end of the podcast where, you know, only the hardcore listeners are in at this point. And so I thought we could do another deep dive on some uh, hardcore technical accounting. And so I have another article from the Journal of Accountancy entitled SEC Amends Disclosure Rules for Acquisitions and Disposals. And so what it is is that the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, has published guidance that they are going to be changing the rules for the disclosure footnotes for, uh, for both acquisitions and disposals. The changes are intended to improve information for investors and facilitate more timely access to capital and also to reduce the cost of preparing the disclosure. And so what they're specifically doing is that there is a portion of the, of the footnote for disclosing an acquisition or a disposal in which there is a test called the investment test. And this is where I might need you guys to jump in, but my understanding of it is, is that there's a test called the investment test in which they're going to change it to where the numerator of that test will be uh, focused on aggregate worldwide market value when available, as opposed to the book value of the company being acquired or disposed of. And the whole substance of the change is to uh, try to uh, avoid the measurement mismatch that happens when you're comparing sale price to book to book value on um, a set of assets as they're getting bought through, a, uh, through an acquisition or a disposal. And so I'm not sure that I've maybe worded it uh, to the best, you know, in, in the best way, but that's the idea. And uh, I guess I just wanted to talk through the change a little bit and see if you guys think it's a change that uh, makes sense. Well, this is the face I make when I read anything I, that's issued by the SEC because my brain hurts like half the time when I read that stuff. I always like, they always lead off that they're trying to enhance financial, you know, distribution of their reports or whatever. But to be clear, like the SEC only guide, uh, guidance is issued for publicly traded companies. So as far, as far as this rule change goes, this is only applicable to publicly traded companies. Sure. But it is kind of a barometer of, you know, like in the past, private companies and such have gleamed onto what SEC says and kind of, it's why you always hear about the, the three-year auditor rule in nonprofits. They always have to switch auditors every three years. It came up in some meeting one time that it was a good idea. It was postulated, but never uh, uh, you know, accepted. But for some reason, it got in the zeitgo to the public. Um, so it's not that these things won't or can't affect uh, private businesses or nonprofits or anything like that. But um, often these rules are for very large companies that are publicly listed. So, um, and the other funny part of the, that I found of the proclamation was that it was supposed to reduce the cost of preparing the footnote. 
And anytime, and I think this is the first change there was in 30 years, I can guarantee you that most of those footnotes are copy and pasted from the year before and the cost of continuing to do the footnote in the same way and the worksheets that are set up around it and the accounting around it is, is been in place for 30 years. Now you're making a change and you're saying it's to reduce the cost of putting together the footnote. I have a feeling that it's probably going to cost quite a bit more over the next year or so because people are going to have to change the way they're doing the footnote and the calculation. So I don't know. Um, that's my take on it, I guess. I, I don't know. Well, that's good. We, we need a take like that. Cause honestly, I mean, that's, that's, that's the facts of it. A lot of the times, you know, if it's something that we're boilerplate copy pasting over and running through the test on, then yeah, it's, it's difficult to change that in a way that really adds value. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's like uh, way to go. Charlie was such a technical topic. Like, like <laughs> I really have no, <laughs> I have really no perspective on this whatsoever. I mean, I think, I think the gist of it is, is, is it comes down to uh, the, doing the test a different way means that the disclosure would happen more often um, or less often, or it would line up with when, when they think that the disclosure should happen kind of thing, right? Which is, yeah, that's what it is. you know, these are academic arguments that they kind of look at, they research, they kind of say, okay, what's the, what is the information value of doing this in a different way? And then, and then they, make this rule change and then for the next 10 years academics will study like did this how did this rule change actually change what companies disclosed and can they somehow isolate any kind of effect in the market or any kind of investor behavior uh, related to this change and it's you know you think well that sounds impossible that you can do that but accounting researchers finance and finance researchers actually they do that. They like figure out that it's kind of crazy the way the ways the methods and stuff they use, but that's the kind of capital market research as they call it is, is what they try to do to, to figure out what is the effect of different kinds of disclosures. So, I mean, that's the context of something like this. Right. And I, I just want, want to kind of, uh, I want to, um, uh, enhance something of what AJ said about the SEC, the SEC rules being only applicable to the public companies and, and that's, you know, basically that that's the right idea. Um, more specifically, um, it's any, usually it's any SEC registrant. So there is a, there's a slightly wider possibility of who might be subject to SEC rules than just public companies per se. Um, but the concept that AJ was getting at was that when you talk about what gap is and financial accounting rules, there is, there is, there is that foundation layer of gap, which is promulgated by the FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board. And then from there, governmental entities can layer in on top of that, specifically the Securities Exchange Commission for the United States will provide their own layer of additional rules that go on top of that. So like when I said, way to go, Charlie, about defining some like very like technical specific rule, I mean, we're fine. This is a very narrow application kind of thing in that sense, because we're talking about a rule that is part of the SEC's application layer to the financial reporting standards. Um, so it would only, as AJ said, it would only apply to SEC registrants. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have any off the cuff uh, reaction to it other than um, providing that just the context of, you know, when, a, you know, as AJ did, why they might make these kind of changes, whether in practice that kind of change does what they think it does. And, you know, how do they go about deciding to make a change like this? It's through kind of research and thinking about if that would enhance the public's information to make better investment decisions. And then how do they go about researching whether it was effective? Like I said, for the next 10 years, there'll be, there'll be research done uh, on uh, seeing if they can isolate changes in data or information that occurred as a result of this, uh, people reporting differently under this rule. Um, that's all I can add. Sorry. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you for cleaning up my $5 truck stop footnote of what the SAC is. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. You got another one we can go over? We did all mine, right? I think we got through my three. All right. Um, I guess the only one left is the... All right. Thanks for watching our podcast. Make sure you subscribe, hit the notification bell, leave a comment of you want to talk about anything further that we've discussed during the show and tell your friends and we'll see you next week. <laughs>
Thanks for watching.